Wonderful. Thank you, Julie. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We're going to be going through chapters two and three today. So you don't have to have read ahead, but if you did, wonderful. It's really good stories that I really enjoyed. Again, you just really enjoy rereading and going through them and learning things that you didn't know before. It's always a good time when you're going through scripture. You don't know what you're going to get. So I can review a few things that Pastor Rebecca went through last week. So there are different um, books in this, in the Gospel of John. And the one that we're in currently is called the Book of Signs. And it's over three years of Jesus' ministry. And there's seven signs that go on. So we're going to go through the first one, which is uh, the turning the water into wine at the wedding of Cana. And all of these are pointing to the eventual resurrection of Jesus. Um, and I just wanted to go over the theological themes, because again, these are things that we'll see in these next two chapters. So right, one thing we see is the origin of Jesus. We see that in chapter one, literally the first few verses, right in the beginning was the word. Um, so it talks about Jesus' relationship to God and Jesus' identity, right? So we'll see that in these next two chapters. We see the incarnation, its purpose, which is the revelation of God, the salvation of humanity. Um, we'll see witness as primary point of discipleship and our relationship to God, becoming children of God and abiding with God. And along with that, I didn't write those up there, but there are important Hebrew roots and references. In the beginning, Jesus lived among us. Um, important images of light and darkness, which we'll see in chapter three. And uh, the image of abundance, of grace upon grace, of just so much goodness to come from God, from Jesus in these next two chapters. So we're gonna start in chapter two with this first story, the first 12 verses. I'll go ahead and start us off this morning since we are a little bit behind, but that's okay. Um, so chapter 12, I mean, chapter two, verses one through 12, so on page 93 in the New Testament section here. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come." His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there, there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it when the steward tasted the water that had then become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went to Capernaum with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they remained there a few days. This is a great story. I love this story. There's so much, there's so many layers going on here to the story. Right, so it begins on the third day there was a wedding. This is a random kind of third day. It doesn't say in the previous chapter, the first day, second day, then you get to the third day. So we know that the number three has a theological significance, right? So specifically it talks about resurrection, newness, life. That's what three usually symbolizes within the Bible. And there was a wedding. It's not some, his first time doesn't happen at a very specific religious event or specifically in the temple or even in Jerusalem. It happens in this town that only occurs here in John um, and then doesn't occur in the other gospels. It's just a small town where this wedding is going on, this celebration of relationship, right? It is a religious ceremony that is going on, but not super sacred as we would think that the first sign of Jesus's ministry 
would usually happen in, right? It's a, it's a point of celebration, right? Weddings were usually a week long. So there had to be a lot of wine, a lot of drinking went on at these weddings. And so by the third or fourth day, people are usually drunk. So you don't usually need to bring out the good stuff. So that's what also makes it significant in this, in this story, right? But it doesn't have to do necessarily with the wine itself, right? The wine is a symbol of Jesus, specifically Jesus, what Jesus brings, the joy and the goodness. That even though we've had all this time, at the end would be the sweet, sweet, sweet goodness of Jesus, right? So I also love, again, this wedding. It brings Jesus' humanness. And it brings, Jesus brings God into day-to-dayness, right? A moment of, again, a relationship of people gathering together. It symbolizes um, something we can, the joy of salvation found in Jesus, even though it's a, it's a human event per se, right? Even though it can't fully encapsulate the joy and the salvation found in Jesus, it's used as a close enough. You understand what it's like to be at a wedding. Right, the joy, the celebration, the excitement of a new relationship, of new families coming together. And again, I love that it points to Jesus's divinity in the sign, but also the humanness of Jesus, under, which we'll see eventually that Jesus is among the people, right? So um, here we see Jesus's mother, Mary, she is not named. Um, throughout the entire Gospel of John. Um, she is just referred to as Jesus's mother. Um, but as we noted last week, there isn't technically a birth story, right? We don't see this birth story. But from the get-go, from the first sign, the first, the beginning of Jesus's ministry, we understand that his mother plays an important role. And she's at his first sign here, and she will eventually be at the cross, at the feet of the cross, when Jesus is crucified and dies. She's at the beginning and she's at the end, right? And so there is no traditional birth story as mentioned because Jesus comes from the beginning, as we see in chapter one. But while on earth, even though Jesus is led and instructed by God, we also see that there is Jesus's mother to help lead him and to help raise him. God is his father and Mary is mother and it speaks to specifically Jesus is, again, divinity and humanity, and it shows that those two cannot be separated or uh, compartmentalized, right? So it also shows that his mother is believing, right? She knows who Jesus is. We don't really get a description of what she's seen or what she knows, but she knows enough that she lets him know, just with that one phrase, oh, they run out of wine. And he says, what is that to me? Why does that matter to me, Mom, that these people didn't plan well enough in advance to have enough wine for all of their wedding guests? But she knows something, obviously, as the mother of Jesus. And his response seems kind of rude. He seems kind of brash with his mother. But again, it's, it's showing that Jesus is listening to, to God, right? Jesus will do what is necessary, directed by God. But also, in... Mary's believeness and her believing, she shows um, that it's important to be dependent on Jesus, right? Do what he says, she says, and they do. That's a, that's a key theme or importance for John here is that uh, discipleship, salvation is dependent on Jesus. So, um, yeah, what do you think about this story? What kind of, what, um, do you have questions about what speaks to you most in this story when you when you hear it and you read it? I like the fact that when he says, "Woman, what is it to you?" She just lets it go. She she she, she doesn't really get into it. She says to the servant, um, "Do what they tell do what he tells you." And that's it. Um, um, it, it. It makes me feel like she's quite a wise woman um, to just let it be done um, and let it go. Yeah. And I also really like the 
part of the banquet, but when the wedding was over, they went to um, to Capernaum. To the to Capernaum, yeah, I forgot the name. Um, and spent a few days because that means that there's still time for the family to come together and spend time with one another in this very busy life. Else? Well, this is Amy Vincy King Winnie. I know I heard the story and I probably read it a long time ago, so I didn't get it all this um, But the, his mother was there. You know, I never really realized, you know, there's something you don't always remember that part of the table, that it was Mary who was there. So, yeah. That's mm -hmm. easy. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but Mary Jane had said it was quite impactful. So, Carol had her hand up. Oh. Well, you know, in hearing you talk about it, Tessa, the, you know, the point that everybody else is talking about, about what Mary says and what Mary does there, it just kind of brings out that Jesus was not ready because he thought the time was not ready for him to be revealed to anyone that, that he was other than just another person, another wedding guest. Um, but it seems that Mary's faith provided the, the bridge for this, you know, this thing to come into the world, this sign to come into the world from God through Jesus because of Mary's faith, that Mary's faith made that bridge. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Cheryl. That brings up a really good point, um, especially as we see in verse 11, it notes that Jesus did this, the first of his signs and revealed his glories and his disciples believed in him, but only partially, only partially, right? They don't really get it until the until Jesus resurrects, right? I think it notes, um, I don't know if it's in this chapter or the next chapter, right? But it's important, I think Cheryl's, Cheryl brought something up that is important is that faith in Jesus, belief in Jesus is needed. It's not just a, Oh, we see the sign and oh, we believe, but it's this deep, deep faith in who Jesus is and who Jesus was sent by to do this work. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, and the, yeah. the word there for first uh -huh. is actually back in John 1 1, beginning. It's nice. the same word. Yeah. So kind of harkening back first, to. Yeah, harkening back. Yeah. Because usually um, in when these signs occur, there's going to be seven. When these happen, Jesus kind of gives an explanation of what's going on, what happened in this story that doesn't really happen, right? Like Julie mentioned the language and I think the subtlety of the faith that Mary had in Jesus shows what is going on, right? Um, and so I kind of want to go back to the theological themes, right? Because it kind of talks to this, I think the story touches on all of those, right? The origin of Jesus from the beginning. So the time is from the beginning, right? The time is now. Right, because Jesus is from the beginning, the incarnation, the Jesus is humanness um, and divinity, the humanness with his, his mother there um, and the divinity with the sign that happens. The witness, I think Mary is, is the witness in this story, right? She just, again, she just knows what's going on. She says this should be done. And because of that, other people get to also see Jesus, his time and what happens, right? And our relationship to God, becoming children of God. This the wine in this story again symbolizes that Jesus brings salvation now, and that it's and it kind of shows his, his miraculous power, but it's super subtle in this sign, right? It's not really big, and not everybody sees, and not everybody understands, and it doesn't cause the show for everybody to go out into the town and to share what's going on, as we will see with the woman at the well in chapter four. Right, it's super subtle. Only a few group of people know what's going on in this story, but it obviously shows who Jesus is. Yes, Kathy. It's, <clears throat> sorry, I think it's also noteworthy that he didn't just make okay wine that because nobody would notice because they were all drunk. He made really good, the best wine. He did it right. He did his creation was perfect rather than good enough. Could he make? Bad wine, though. <laughs> I mean, if it got away with it, nobody would have noticed. 
Would you be able to make anything less than what he did make? Amazing. No, I don't. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. It's noteworthy that he did. Yeah. That what he made was perfect. So good that even people who I'm assuming the steward probably is also have been drinking throughout this time can tell that this stuff is really, really good. And that's again a symbol of Jesus's salvation, of how the joy that we find in Jesus is so so good. Right? We've known before, we've had all these other things before, but now that Jesus is on the scene, it's so so good. Think of like your favorite meal, but it's something that you just really love to have, but it being the most perfect meal. It's so, so good. It's the best version of it. You just want more and more and more of it, right? For me, it's these like, it's this bread from Mexico called the concha. And when it's, I could just eat just so many of them, right? Like they're just so, so good that I want more and more. So. Thank you, Kathy. Yes. All right, let's move on to this next section. Uh, Jesus at the temple. Again, Jesus is just super sassy and kind of uh, brash in this chapter, but it's all for a reason, and we'll see why. Um, can I have somebody read verses 13 through um, 13 through 21? Yeah, let's do that. No, hold on, sorry, I have to let me get this back. Verses 13 through um, 25, yeah, let's do that. No, sorry, 13 through 22. There we go. Can somebody read verses 13 through 22? The Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it is written, deal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years. And will you raise it up in three days? But he was of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So this Spoilers. <laughs> uh, this event occurs in all, all four Gospels, but this one in particular occurs during the first Passover Jesus experiences. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this event occurs on Jesus' last Passover before he is arrested and crucified. Um, so it occurs first. Um, and there only in John does Jesus make a whip of cords, which is, sounds really intense, and then drives out the livestock and the money changers and making them spill their coins. So um, that is included here. But this story, um, when you first listen to it, is super ironic, right? So in verse 16, he says, he told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. The irony is, is the temple needed the market in order to survive, right? So they needed what was going on here to actually survive in order for the temple to continue for it being a place that people could go and to worship God and be in relationship to God, right? So they're like, what are you talking about? This is it's necessary, right? Um, however, um, Jesus isn't right, upset necessarily at these specific transactions, right? He's not talking about moments of greed, but he's wanting to dismantle the entire system, right? The temple and everything else that is going that allows it to survive. And the reason why is because the temple is no longer necessary. And why is the temple no longer necessary? Because Jesus, yes, the answer to every Sunday school question, Jesus, right? Jesus is now the embodiment, the incarnation of God and is walking among them. Especially in this moment, the irony, right? 
we need this. Oh, this is important. What are you talking about? And she's like, I'm right here. I'm standing right here. None of this is necessary. I'm right here. Right? So, I mean, explicitly says, right, the temple is Jesus's body. It is the dwelling place of God. It is, you know, Jesus's body, the incarnation, this life, it is signs of all that witness to God. But also Jesus is also God, right? So this temple is no longer necessary when we see here how to get to God. It was before the temple, but now it's through Jesus, right? Good morning, Patrice. Good morning. So these stories, though, they seem kind of the se separate stories. These stories hand in hand at the start of Jesus's ministry reveal who he is, right? They reveal his relationship to God and the importance of witness and our relationship now to God. Jesus is embodying the new and displacing the old, right? Um, so what do, you, what do you see or what do you like about in this, in this story here? Sometimes action is necessary. 93. At the top. We're at the top. Yeah, page we're on page 93. 93. Did one of you? Yes, Kathy said something. Kathy. Sometimes action is necessary. You can't just sit and let the world. You can't just sit and be uh, peaceful and meditative and let everything happen around you without taking action. And, you know, you can't yeah. just be passive. You have to take action sometimes. Yeah. Betty? Bill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, first I was disagreeing with Kathy, but I, what I like uh, out of it, though, too, is to me, it, signifying the purification of uh, worship to the Lord uh, as essentially because remember Jesus said do not turn da, da, da. you know there's a place of worship okay even though the marketplaces were there and and it was an instrument for people to gather or of joy and more people in a sense if humanity had the pure purity, to keep the house of God a place of worship that would have pleased Jesus. Uh, but that wasn't really taking place. It, it was, it was, uh, oh, um, the temple, it, it's here to worship, but it's kind of a, uh, our county fair type thing for the moment. And so I think that's what he was angry about. Okay. And, and, and I think that takes place today. Uh, he, he wants a purification of worship, a purification of heart. Because uh, in, in earlier Gospels, maybe in John, I, didn't, I don't remember, I know I read it, is that uh, you're to make your ways perfect. And that's what we try to, that's what I try to strive for today. That's all. Thank you. I, I wasn't really going to say it, but I think that is a really good thing. Just making sure that your relationship with God is pure. You know, to set these other things aside. You know, your daily words, your groceries, your things in the house, etc. Put that aside, and then just concentrate. That's what that said to me when I got from the like, But then again, another thing that I thought was interesting is that um, it says when he was in Jerusalem. Of course, this is going over twenty three. You can maybe jump ahead. <laughs> Um, many believed in his name because they saw the signs, but he pulled back. And he said he did not trust himself to them because he knew that people, I don't know, I think he had a, a feeling, a predilection um, that he didn't want people to really know that much about him yet. Maybe he knew that there'd be one that would absorb him, maybe he obviously at the end. So, yeah. you know, I. I knew this before, but then reading it again, I 
Yeah. Again, you see, yeah, people believing in <coughs> time. And it, it's noting that there is this faith in Jesus, but not all of the faith that people are proclaiming is trustworthy, right? And we're also, or that it's understood, as we'll see in the next chapter, um, specifically with Nick Jr., right? So, but I think this is talking, um, through, yeah, more uh, about the greatest revelation that we have as Christians, right? Which is Jesus Christ. And unfortunately for us and for the readers of scripture, we don't get to necessarily meet incarnate Jesus, right? So the best we have is the scriptures, but the scriptures again point to what we have, who we're supposed to be dependent on the most important revelation even though we have all this history, we have all this law, is, is Jesus. The other stuff does matter, but at the end of the day, Jesus is what matters. Jesus is the witness of God. In Jesus, we find God, right? So, um, like I said, it's hard because we haven't necessarily met Jesus, that all we have is the scriptures, um, but, and we have not encountered God incarnate, but we are able to believe to know Jesus through the scriptures. But are there other ways, I would say, or a question in your life where you think you've encountered Jesus? Right? Are there people, are there situations in your life where you have met others that have had Christ likeness? You don't have to share, but if you if you would like to share, I um, would love to hear about um, a person or a relationship or a moment. <laughs> well, well, there's many times in my life yeah. that I have encountered Jesus, mm -hmm. but a lot of people don't believe, you know, when I share my testimony, they'd be like, that didn't happen. And it's like, well, how am I here? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, uh, you know, come up with some other things and I just sit there and just look at them and, you know, I just tell them, why did you ask me? You know, cause I'm a firm believer, you know? And, you know, like uh, one time when I was out there on drugs, you know, I overdosed and, you know, I can, I was, I, you know, how you call it? Uh, we call it uh, the, the out of body experience. I actually saved myself. I was dead. I'm actually looking at my body and I'm actually looking at the people trying to bring me back to life, but I'm actually hearing God telling me it's not time yet. Go do his will. And I actually felt God breathe breath back into this body. And I felt it just a big, a big, and, and don't nobody got no breath like that. That's, a, a, that, that's like a breath for the whole world. And, I felt his breath just, and I just, you know, you take a deep breath, and oh, no, and I'm, you know, the police, I'm there, the police officer, just that, and I'm biting them, and they like, no, no, come on, and I'm like, what, uh, what, what, and they come up, what, you know, what happened? I'm looking at them like, what happened? Y'all tell me what happened. They come up, you open those, and I'm like, they come up, you know what day it is? No, I mean, I think so, and I, you know, and I'm telling you, you know, and they're, and they talking about, you know, what do you mean it ain't time yet? Because I woke up, that was the last word I heard, it ain't time yet. And they talking about, what did you mean it's not time yet? I said, didn't y'all tell me it's not time yet? They said, no, man, we didn't tell you it's not time yet. I said, I heard a voice saying, it's not time yet. Go back, it's not time yet. They all staring at me with a big old light in front of them. I said, I, I see a big old light saying, it's not time yet, go back. They said, no, man, we didn't tell you that. We just brought you back to life. I said, oh, well, a voice said, go back. It ain't time yet. Yeah. And, you know, it was just, it was, they said you were dead over an hour. Ain't nowhere in the world. You over an hour. You are, what, what's the word? Clinically, what's the word they use? Clinically, clinically dead. You are yeah. really clinically. Yeah. The, cl yeah, cl you, you, they should have put you, they should have put me in a freezer and call my parents and pronounce me 
literally dead. But they just something told him to keep going. Something told them to keep going. Yeah. And you know, and there's another time I died, and another time I died, and it's just over and over and over. And it just seemed like it said, girl, you just there's something about you that you just can't die. <laughs> it's like God got plans for you in your life. It's, you know, you need to get yourself clean and, and sober and uh, if somebody's telling you to, to get off these streets and just there's something you're supposed to do. Yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah. it's a, it's yeah. it's an out of body experience. It's just it's just all kind of things. But it's I, I'm just a firm believer, and I just wish others would really, really take that to heart. And I mean, it, it it's real. Yeah. People, uh, people are on their own journey. People are all on their own journey. Yeah, it, it was scary at first. You know, I what my elder I call you my elders, but that's why I'm afraid. It's just showing respect. I understand back then it was scary at first, but I, I've learned how to get through that scary part. It, it, it is scary at first, but it is, it's the truth. Scariness is just close them scary doors and just, oh, oh it's amazing now. Like, ooh, -wee. but it's, 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 it's real. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, class. Yeah. Thank you. Anything, any last comments and thoughts from chapter two? Let's move on to chapter three. Um, Where's chapter three? Nicodemus. Oh, chapter, oh, chapter three. I'm looking at the paper. I'm looking at the paper. You ain't looking at the paper? There's no paper. Oh, we ain't doing the paper? Oh, no, we're doing it. Oh, sorry. I brought the paper. Uh, verses one through 15. One through 15. I can read Thank you. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born from here? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, What do you think do? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things, you do not believe. How can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who ascended the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Whatever believes in him has eternal life. Thank you, Mary Jane. So Nicodemus is a prominent figure and leader within the Jewish community, right? I have a notes here. A Pharisee, a leader of the Jews. And so he comes to Jesus at night. Um, most likely so that others don't know that Nicodemus is visiting him, right? night, darkness, and in. Um, but I also learned that it was at night in which the rabbis worked and um, had discussions. So there could be two different things going on here. Nicodemus knows that Jesus is probably working, but also doesn't want the rest of um, his people to know that he's visiting Jesus. 
And this isn't the last time we'll see Nicodemus. There are two other times, and he is somebody that will eventually, I believe, help bury Jesus. And so Nicodemus' story is long. Um, and we see that although he has some type of faith or some type of belief in Jesus, um, he knows that Jesus is important. He calls him rabbi, says you are from above, from God. He doesn't truly understand, right? Um, I love the story because it's also kind of a play on words. So uh, that word that Jesus is uses in, Jesus uses in the Greek above means again, means anew, and it means from above, right? So it has all these multiple meanings. And so Nicodemus's response seems kind of silly. It seems kind of like, what are you talking about? But he understood it from, uh, from the context. He assumed all right, it was a new or again. So he's like, what do you mean that you can be born again? And he asked, can you go back up into your mother's womb and be born again? Which sounds ridiculous, right? But Jesus meant from above um, in this section. And so um, his follow-up questions make sense if he's confused. Um, but Jesus is saying, no, rebirth, newness comes from God. It comes from above. But again, they're on two different levels. They're kind of just not really understanding because Nicodemus isn't un really understanding who Jesus is and where Jesus comes from, right? He sees them as a rabbi. He sees them as important. But true belief would understand and know that Jesus is from God, right? This language is above is, you know, pointing towards the heaven, pointing to God. But Nicodemus doesn't really understand that. And so he's not really understanding what Jesus is trying to say here, right? Um, and then Jesus notes, he, um, so Jesus answered Nicodemus' funny question with, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. This is one of the very few times that Jesus uh, mentions the kingdom of God. It's not very often in John, so this is one of the few. Um, so being born of water and spirit, what do you think of first? Baptism, right? Being born again through dumps, sprinkled, poured the water, whatever tradition. Um, those who follow here, we practice the dunking. Um, but referring to baptism, which is then followed by the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? We see that constantly in Acts. Um, somebody's baptized and then the Holy Spirit falls upon them, which we know it doesn't always happen that way, and that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. But for John's purposes here, that's what he's talking about. Um, but it's also more than baptism, right? Jesus, um, but it speaks of Jesus, who is the living water, which is needed. Water is, need, is a basic necessity for sustaining life, right? Water has to do with sustenance and nurture what is essential to live. Right, the mention of the spirit is also speaks to that of becoming a child of God, right? It's referencing again to the beginning of God breathing God's breath into Adam, a new creation, a new created identity. Rebirth is born from God, from above, right? So again, it's going, it's drawing back to the stories we just saw of newness, of rebirth, of Jesus being this new thing from God but also God, right? It's, there's so many layers going on here. I absolutely love it. Um, and again, just the water and the spirit, right? There's so much that goes on there that talks about newness and life and um, importance for life. Jesus, again, I think we'll see this uh, the woman at the well, right? Jesus being the water. Um, uh, so yeah, what do you like in the story? What, what speaks out to you? Well, here in 17 is talking about condemnation. And it said, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And that if you believe in him, then you are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in him. Only so. I thought that was interesting. He was not there. 
tell everybody how awful they are. And to bring them forth and say, you know. So that was one part of that. Yeah, so what is Nick? So Nicodemus here is worried about condemnation or judgment from the people, right? What happens? What would happen if he said Jesus is the Messiah, if Jesus is God, right? And so a response to this is for God to love the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have, may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world. But in order that the world might be saved through him, those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, the light that has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. Those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done. To be saved is to be an intimate relationship with God. Right? And as uh, kind of going back to Patrice, right? Every story will look different for each person. Mm -hmm. Each story of salvation for all of us here will look different from the next. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's really special and it's really awesome in this becoming child and children of God, mm -hmm. right? Um, but in this context, particularly, we see that this speaks to the community of believers who have followed Jesus and are now expelled from their synagogues, right? Encountering Jesus in, in the gospel is a moment, I like um, this word here, I think condemned also, in the, in the Greek goes down to crisis, right? So should you believe or not? Should you believe Jesus or not? Because again, what does that mean? What does that deeper layer mean? What does it mean when you believe in Jesus? In this context is that you are probably expelled from your community. You're probably even worrying about yourself. If, oh, did I make the right decision? Right, should I have done that? Should I have followed Jesus? Because I no longer am part of this community that I was, that I grew up in. Um, and it's so difficult, right? Because God did not come, did not send Jesus to condemn the world, right? That the world may, may be saved through him. I'm still going to follow Jesus, expelled and not. Because exactly. God overruled the community. Yeah, so it's saying here, it's kind of difficult because it's saying that it's not the... It's not that God is condemning here, right? It's the community that you have once left, you have once been a part of, especially in this context uh, for Jews who are now following Jesus, right? Nicodemus comes in the night so that other people won't see what is going on. Yeah. Right, because what happens, exactly what happens is you will be condemned by the people there. I know this can be used as a, as a blanket statement of what everybody but, should do in order to be saved, but it's not as specifically in this community that's what that looks like but isn't that like every community that you live in and that almost seems like every community that we ever lived in they always do you know when somebody get ready to move they always condemn you oh you know you're moving oh you just not just, you ain't you ain't a friend of all this like hold up wait a minute i'm still your friend i'm still gonna always still come back and visit still gonna, still gonna shop in the same community as I may not shop as often there, but you'll still see me. I mean, hold on, wait a minute. Yeah. Why are you hating on me now? Because all the places that I used to live at, are they still see me. Hey, bro, I thought I'd ever see you. Do you still shop over there? Yes. Yeah. I'm still your friend. I still call them. Yeah. They still got my number. I mean, I just don't come over there as often because I live so what? It's too, I don't got the gas money to go over there no more. It's like, you gonna give me the gas money? I, 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 I stop over there as much as I used to, but I don't got the gas money no more. It's just too far. It's like, hold up, whoa, what a minute. Oh, now you hate me because I live way over there, and I don't live way over there no more. Like, I mean, hold up, what, mm, what? But let me move back over there. It's still cool, buddy. Oh, you like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. oh, now, now we been, oh, oh, mm, what, is, oh, what? And so then we go into the next section here where it talks about John the Baptist. We saw John the Baptist in chapter one, 
Um, and in that section happens Jesus's baptism or um, the, Holy, the dove, the Holy Spirit falls upon Jesus and God says, this is my son, homo, please. It's not explicitly, you don't get the story, the whole story, but we get a glimpse of that. And we get a glimpse of John the Baptist saying, I am just, uh, they're asking, who is he? Who are you, John? What are you doing? He says, I'm just the, I'm just, uh, the messenger. I'm just the guy who's oh. preparing the way for the other guy. Oh, that happened to John. Yes. And so we see this again here in oh, this cool. section here, right? So Jesus, uh, oh, I, I think this is the only section in scripture we see Jesus baptizing people. I could be incorrect, but we have Jesus mm. baptizing people. And also John is also baptizing people oh, at the yeah. same time. Maybe the only time they're both baptizing people at the same time. Um, that doesn't sound correct, but if somebody knows, let me know. Um, and so this story is essentially a contrast to Nicodemus, right? So Nicodemus symbolizes the old ways um, and, and struggles to understand who Jesus is because he's letting those old ways get in the way. Right? Nicodemus, here. Nicodemus is. But then we see John the Baptist who fully understands who Jesus is and gives witness to who Jesus is and his relationship to Jesus, right? So he ends here, the friend, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, Jesus, the friend of the bridegroom, which is um, John, who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. For this reason, my joy has been fulfilled. He must decrease, he must increase, but I must decrease. John has no... No palms, he's out in the open, it's daytime, right? The religious leaders are asking him, or his people, his disciples are asking him, what's going on? Who is he? Who are you? What is what's going on? And out in the open, he witnesses fully understanding who Jesus is. Right? No one can receive anything except what has been given from heaven, from above. Mm -hmm. Right? So everything that Nicodemus is questioning, what are you talking above? What what is all of this? John the Baptist says to his, this exactly lays it out completely for us. Mm -hmm. He's understanding and gives witness to who Jesus is. And he finds joy, that joy that we mentioned earlier at the at the wedding, mm -hmm. the joy of newness, of, of new life found in Jesus, mm -hmm. the bridegroom here, the best man per se, John, right? He sees Jesus and rejoices greatly and knows that Jesus must increase his dependency on who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing must increase and what John is doing slowly will decrease and eventually a portion of he will be killed for making and preparing this way for him, right? And so let's end with 31 to 36. We'll read it for us. Um, it's kind of weirdly placed. People with uh, commentary suggest that this probably should go after the story of Nicodemus because of the language it uses. Um, so we'll go through it real, before we end here. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks about earthly things. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, yet no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted his testimony has certified this, that God is true. He whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has placed all things in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever disobeys the Son will not see life, but must endure God's life. Right, so again, it goes back to the old ways versus the new ways. The old versus the new, right? Jesus is from above. Jesus is the newness, is the goodness that is given by God. Whoever accepts his accepted his testimony has certified this, that God is true. Whoever believes in Jesus and proclaims Jesus and knows Jesus is from above proclaims that God is true, right? And this will be a, I mean, this will be a struggle as Jesus, for all Jesus' ministry as he continues. There will be those who do not believe, who partially believe, and those who will believe, right? Without question, and will be those witnesses and will be those testimonies of God's trueness, I think especially in the next chapter with the woman um, at the well, which would be a really, really good question. Any last comments? Yeah, about... Nick, 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 the Lord Jesus, help me with that word. Nicodemus? Nicodemus, is that the one that got blinded? I, 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 gotta, I, I, gotta, I need help. I got to remember this again. 
Is that the one that got blinded to the road? To the no, no, the, the, okay. How far am I out? Am I out? Are you thinking of the Bible? That's all. Okay, yeah. Nicodemus. Yeah. Well, who is Nicodemus again? The leader of the Pharisees. You'll he's, see. He's yeah, he's the leader of the Pharisees. He's a leader. Yeah, he's, he's a teacher leader. of the law. Yeah. He what? He was a teacher of the law. We'll see him later in John. He comes yeah, up a couple more times. more times in John. Yeah. You'll see his transition. So he's the one that fought Jesus, I mean, uh, rebelled against Jesus or? No, no. no. He's kind of, he's in the background figuring this Jesus thing out and we get to journey along with him. Oh, yeah. all right. Anybody else do have anything else? Kind of no? Thank you so much for your Thank comments. Thank you. I'll have so that great. coming late. I'll, I'll tell you. See you that. later. Thank, Thank you. you. I call him kind of a side actor. Uh, 